When we think of fatherhood, we think of biological fathers, yet fatherhood is so much more than this. There are men who are giants because they are willing to step up and be fathers to kids who have no father in their life. And today, you're going to meet one of them, so don't go anywhere. Welcome to the Fatherhood Challenge, a movement to awaken and inspire fathers everywhere to take great pride in their role and to challenge society to understand how important fathers are to the stability and culture of their family's environment. Now, here's your host, Jonathan Guerrero. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My guest is Ray Biggerstaff. Ray is not only a devoted father and husband, but he's also a foster dad. And today we're going to learn from Ray what fatherhood is all about. Ray, thank you so much for being on the Fatherhood Challenge. Well, thank you for having me, Jonathan. It's great to be here. And thanks for the introduction. Absolutely. Ray, what is your favorite dad joke? <laughs> I knew this question was coming. And so uh, <laughs> I listened before. So I'll... I'll just say this, I, uh, as a father, I typically, I love the, the spontaneous, sarcastic jokes that come out. Those aren't rehearsed, but one that comes to mind, that always comes to mind. My, my boys love it. My daughter cringes. So it's a little bit of potty humor, but it goes like this. Uh, it says, if you're an American, when you go into the bathroom and you're an American, when you come out of the bathroom, what are you while you're in the bathroom? <laughs> European. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, love, I love that one. <laughs> well, I'm going to add to that. So what are you when you're done? You're finished. There. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one is definitely a favorite. So Ray, let's go ahead and start out with your story. Why and how did you become a foster parent? Well, let's see. I, I think to answer that question, I have to go back in time. I go back 17 years. My wife and I are celebrating 17 years of marriage this fall, and that's really when the oh, that's, congratulations! Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, I, you know, this, you know, we together, my wife and I started the dream about what our life would be when we were engaged to be married, and and what our family, what we wanted our family to be, and uh, really what we began the. Uh, discuss and, and dream about was how we wanted to grow our family. We wanted to have lots of children, which was a good thing, a good thing. And uh, we were on the same page there. We wanted to have children in different ways. We wanted to obviously try to have biological children, of course, but we also wanted to, you know, care for children without families and even adopt one day. That was, that was on our, our minds and hearts. And, and I should add that, add that uh, at that time, my wife and I worked together and we worked uh, for a Christian ministry in Las Vegas, Nevada, of all places. Uh, and, and we were transitioning our work toward foster care at the same time. And so we would go on to eventually go on to lead and pioneer and a longstanding foster care organization in that city. And, but those early days, we didn't know that we were just again, planning it. And so our hopes and desires for our, our own family as we were preparing to get married matched the work that we wanted to do. And, and during that time, this would have been mid 2000s, uh, foster, Las Vegas was going through a foster care crisis. Uh, you could say that it was all over the news. There are simply too many children and not enough families to care for them. Wow. And so we were just aware of this and, and, uh, it became, you know, it, it brought the issue to the forefront of our minds and quickly became a part of our conversations related to our work and then also for our, ourselves personally. So, so we soon realized that we, we would not just be working in foster care, but we were going to, if, if we were going to ask others to become foster parents, we ourselves needed to respond to that call. Uh, so yeah, that's just what we did. We just a few months after we were married, we, we began our foster care journey and we will go on to foster for more than a decade, caring for more than 14 children over that period of time, two of which we have adopted since then. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tell me about an experience you've had as a foster dad that made you feel proud of what you do. There's a lot I could say there that, that I could be proud about. Uh, you know, I, I think what, what, I think what obviously comes to mind, what rises to the, to the top is, is our, our adoption stories. You know, I, I just mentioned we've, we've adopted two kids. So 14 children came through our home over that period of time, two stayed. So all the others we would care for for a period of time, temporary period of time, and they would return home to their biological families. But for these two, uh, you know, we were given the opportunity to adopt them. We were told by someone early on, if we were to foster for any any length of time, uh, the opportunity for adoption would come to us. And so our heart's desire was to adopt eventually, but we didn't 
go into it with that intention initially. Uh, but again, the opportunity came. My son, who is now 16 years old, my oldest son, he was three when he came into our family. And he, you know, he had a very difficult first three years of life. He was born and placed into foster care right away as a newborn. Then he returned home, returned home to his mother. Uh, but she was unable to care for him. She, she had a ton of addiction challenges and, and uh, mental health uh, challenges. And so as a result, at three years old, he entered back into foster care again. And that's when he found himself into our family. And initially, we, we were expecting just to foster him temporarily. We weren't looking to adopt him, or at least that wasn't our, our intention. But early on, the, his caseworker came to us and said, we're, we're likely going to need an adoptive home. And so he, she asked us if we would be that family for him. If not, she would need to find a family, move him to another home that would be willing to do that. But we nearly immediately said, yes, <laughs> yes, we will be that. And so we went on to adopt him. It took about three years for adoption to be finalized. But, you know, adoption is, you know, my experience is when when the adoption is finalized in family court, it's, it's very similar to having a child born to you naturally. You realize, wow, you know, he, he is my son. He will carry my name. I have the honor of grafting him into our family. And just as if he was born to me, all family inheritance is passed along to him. You're not just the physical inheritance, but all the other good things that we give our children. And, and so it, it was just, uh, you know, when that adoption was finalized, it was just, it was an amazing, you know, an amazing weight of responsibility that came onto my shoulders as a dad in a good kind of way, in the best kind of way, you know. Um, you just realize he is my son. And, and that's just, you know, that's a tremendously proud moment. And, and my daughter, our oldest daughter, who's now 19, but we adopted her when she was 11. So a few years after we adopted our son, we adopted her and same story, you know, just the, so proud of it, that, so proud to be called their father. And so, so I think that that rises to the top when I'm most proud of. Did any part of this feel like a spiritual calling for example, uh, being a foster parent and also adopting. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we we were motivated by our faith to even get into foster care to begin with. Uh, you know, it was it was our, you know, it, we felt called to love others and, and, and foster care and adoption is truly living out the gospel of Jesus in that sense. And so, you know, I admire there's there's an author. Uh, that's written, a Christian author has written a lot about foster care. And he says something like this. He says, Jesus sees hard places and broken people and he moves toward them, not away. Mm-hmm. He calls his people to do the same thing. And so that was our motivation through this whole thing, to move toward these hard places and not away. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. As you were answering that question, I had this this text popped into memory. It's the story of, uh, of David uh, when David was all about trying to build the sanctuary and whatnot. And God was trying to, in a very gentle way, explain to him that uh, you're not going to be the one to build it. It's going to be your son that builds it. And it goes off into a somewhat different direction. The conversation does where God basically says, Oh, by the way, I'm going to be a father to your son. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. right away we get a little bit of a hint of this whole foster parent concept and what God himself has to say about it and what he thinks about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, there, and in fact, scripture is there, there, many of the heroes of the faith experienced uh, foster care, you could say, or adoption in some way or another from Moses to, you know, Joseph, Jesus' father, even in a sense. And so and, and all that represents the spiritual adoption that we receive as sons and daughters of God. So it's a, it's it's throughout scripture and it's a, it, in many ways at the at the foundation of the gospel itself. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Were there ever moments when you felt overwhelmed and you just wanted to quit? How did you get past those times? Yeah, well, there's certainly many hard times. And I'll say this to anyone listening who is considering foster care, or for those of you who have experienced it, foster care is very hard. It's enduring love for others. It's in, it's it's embracing those hard things. As I just said, you know, it's walking towards those hard places and broken people. Uh, so it, it's hard. It's it's taking on the burden of someone else and into your own home and, and in a very personal way. So, uh, yeah, we felt overwhelmed a lot. You know, when we first started fostering, I I was a young man. I was 23, 24 years old, newly married, <laughs> never been a parent before, uh, you know, barely out of school myself, you know. And so, 
you know, early on, our first, the first placement we had was a little baby. And so we got to experience parenting, you know, somewhat maybe the, the natural progression of parenting, caring for an infant. And then that little baby left our home. We, we, we adored her and she left. And and the second placement, foster placement we had was sisters. We, we decided, my wife and I, that we were ready to uh, take school age kids. And so uh, we took these sisters in. There was a six-year-old girl and she was just adorable, really easy to connect with and play with. And we just, we just loved her so much. And then there was her 14 year old sister <laughs> and, and I love teenagers. They're wonderful. But her, this little, this young woman herself was particularly challenging. And, you know, she was a freshman and you think I'm, I'm about 24 years old and she's 14. I'm, I'm barely 10 years older than she is. How could I, how could I possibly be a father to her? And, and she had only experienced both these girls only experienced really bad examples of men and father like figures in their home. Their mother was, single and had all w- w- tragically was in and out of many abusive relationships. And, and so that's what they experienced and witnessed. And so here I am with this 14 year old who's just angry at the world and, and particularly angry at men. And I have to show her, you know, what, you know, what a father's all about. And I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so there's times like that where I would second guess myself and think, what am I doing? How did I get you know involved in this? And, my wife and I would even talk about, you know, can we keep going? Uh, but, you know, we endured that experience. And and that that young girl, you know, 14, we cared for, we, we actually connected with her a handful of years later when she was a young adult. And, and she told us that one day she wants to be a foster parent. And, and I think that's oh, a little bit wow. of me that, you know, what we did, whatever we did, um, put some good into her heart and, and into her soul. And so, um, you know, and I would say on the, on that question, you know, how do we get past those times? One of the things I learned was it, we should be eager to say yes when it comes to caring for kids in need, in need of homes, need of families. We should be eager to say yes. But it's, it's important to know when to say no as well. And I think there are times in our, there has been times in our family's life where, where we said no to foster care. We said, you know, right now for this season, for these reasons, we need to put the, hit the pause button in a sense. And, and that's what we learned. Sometimes we should absolutely say yes, but sometimes we should also say no to care for ourselves and, and, and the immediate needs in our home. And so, so I think that's how we got through we, learning how to say yes and learning how to say no as well. I think that's absolutely powerful that you left a legacy because you've not only changed the way she now will see men, but you've also carried on a legacy in the fact that she wants to do what you are doing, what you are currently doing. Absolutely. And that's, that's yeah. really powerful. I think we completely underestimate the power of fatherhood on women. Yeah. Yeah. Especially young girls who are looking for what men should be like, how they should be treated and how they should be respected and protected and provided for all those things that fathers do, uh, especially them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a rarity when a foster parent, when, when you foster a child and, they come back later and say, thank you for that. But in this situation she did and, and you know, I'll forever treasure that. I always say a really good father will raise a daughter who in her mind is unstoppable Mm. and she's unstoppable, not because she knows who she is, but she also knows her, her father's behind her Mm. at any cost. And that is absolutely powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's the father I would love to be for my daughters. Mm Mm-hmm. So I want to go at a different angle. We talked about there are times to say no. And um, are there ever times when I'll take a little bit further. Are there ever times when it's time to decide, or maybe we should decide that one is a good fit or not a good fit. And what is that criteria? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, I, a lot of people are hesitant to, understandably so to become a foster parent, become men stepping in, become foster dads. They're, they're hesitant to do it. And, and uh, part of the reason why is they think, well, you know, I can't get too attached to these children. I, I couldn't love them so much that I get so attached and then I have to let them go. I just couldn't do that. And, and I say to those people um, that have that perspective, if you're afraid of getting too attached, too attached to these kids and loving them too much and then needing to let them go, then you are perfect for foster parenting. And so I think that's the litmus wow. test. In the sense. You know, if, if that's where you're at, you're perfect. Now you may have to count that cost a little bit and, 
and uh, and and really search your heart before you step into it. But that that means you have everything it takes. That's exactly what these dear children need: is people willing to get too attached and willing to love them as their own. And uh, you know, e- even if it's only temp- temporary, you know, it's sacrificial. It, it will be hard. Uh, but what is harder than the our broken heart if they have to leave? Um, because that can mend. What's harder is for these children never to know our love at all. And I think that's that's really the the decision we're making when we consider caring for these kids or not. You know, and for dads, I'll say this. You know, um, and, and this is a phrase I'm borrowing from someone else here, but it, it, you know, someone else said it's time to man up for the fatherless, which is quite a challenge. Yes, man up for the fatherless. Uh, you know, if honorable men across this country were to lead their families in the foster care, the game would begin to shift. In, in working yes. in care myself, you know, I often hear women say all the time, I would love to foster, but my husbands are just not ready yet. They're just not willing. And, and I'm telling you, husbands, if you take the lead, your wives will be right there with you. And in many cases, yes. we're waiting on, you know, they're waiting on us to lead. And they're just, <laughs> yes. they're waiting on it. So, so I say to men, you know, if you love the fish and hunt, foster a boy and teach him to fish or hunt. If you love sports, foster a girl, coach your softball team. You know, if you're in a cars, foster a teen, teach him how to drive. <laughs> There's a whole generation of young people desperate for good fathers and they're hurting and their future is bleak. But dads uniquely, as I think you said, they have the power to change that trajectory for these kids. So it's time to man up to the fatherless. And a lot of times, we you know, you thought you were approaching it from a standpoint of emotion where, uh, OK, we don't want to give away our love and affection to someone only to have them gone. But sometimes it's time to think a little bit beyond yourself to future generations. I don't know a dad that if you ask him would say, Oh no, I don't want to leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, unless it's a really, really bad one, um, obviously, but most dads want to leave a lasting legacy Mm -hmm. and, by fostering, by actually doing this, you actually have the power to influence future generations, even long after you're gone. Mm-hmm. That is a lot of influence and a lot of power that you have presently in the moment now. Yeah, it's power. It's power to change uh, the future generations. And that's something that's something special. And speaking of fatherlessness, are we really facing a crisis of kids growing up without a father around? Hmm, yeah, I, th- I think the, the evidence is clear on this. That's we, there is a crisis. The data is out there. And there's new data all the time that says there is a, a, a rapidly growing fatherless crisis in our in our communities and around our country. So yeah, it's it's a big problem, and, and a lot of the social issues that people are struggling with, the painful things people are struggling with, can be rooted back in those broken families and the the lack of a father. And so, yeah, you know, even myself, I relate to that. My biological father was an alcoholic when I was young and my parents divorced when I was young. And, and, you know, that loss of a father, even with a deep love and commitment, my mother showed me as a young boy and she really did. Uh, but that loss of a father is something I still have to carry today and overcome today in various ways. It, it goes deep. It goes right to the, the soul of a person, of a young, young boy or girl. And so my, my mom would go on to marry my stepfather when I was, you know, I was younger and, or a little older. And, and, uh, but even still that dad size hole in my inner being was damaged. And so I, I've had to overcome it. And so there's boys and girls, there's, there's a huge number of boys and girls that are, that absolutely are desperate for dads. They need dads. And many of them are suffering as they become adults. So they carry that into their adulthood and, and repeat that with their own families. And so uh, it's, it's on us to notice this and step in and change that change the next generation. Yes, I can relate to that as well. And that kind of goes into um, the next thing. Besides adopting a child, are are there ways to fill that fatherlessness void in single parent fatherless homes? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say I would say you know, th- there's definitely ways. And it, t- it takes a man to to be attuned to the needs of their community uh, and even notice the need. I think. And so I would say to, to be attuned, you, you can, you know, to notice the, the, the fatherless needs, uh, you know, you can get involved in your church, you can volunteer to youth group or, or 4-H club, or you can coach youth sports, you know, become a community leader in that way. And if you do those types of things, if men were to step into those things, then they'll begin to notice those single parent homes where there's a father missing or, or kids who are struggling. 
and in a grassroots kind of way, you can really meet a need. And, and there, in many communities, there are nonprofit organizations that have some sort of mentorship program. So even if it's not foster care specifically, uh, there are many great mentorship programs out there. You can do some online research and figure out what's in your area. There's a couple of men in my community that saw a need in, a, in, in one of the, the, the heart the poorest neighborhoods in, in the town. And, and they, they, these guys are in the CrossFit. They're in the being fit and healthy. And, and so they started a youth CrossFit nonprofit where it's free for these kids to come. And they have wow. younger kids and then teenagers to come and, and get physically healthy and, and be a part of a community. And that community really helps with that mental health as well. And so they just saw a need and, and they had a certain passion and they stepped into something. So my kids have participated in that program and we've really benefited from it as well. Just even though we don't fit the, um, the, the core demographic, what they're, who, who they're hoping to serve. And so, yeah, look for, look for opportunities, look for mentorship programs and step into them. And the mentorship organizations out there, they often do the hard work for you. They'll, they'll train you, equip you, and then connect you with a child in need. And so, um, and so that I, I definitely lean into those. So you don't really have to just dive into these programs and figure them out. There, there is training and support with a lot of these programs to guide you through it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll equip you, they'll train you, you know, they'll do, do the, you know, the necessary background checks and screenings to make sure everyone's appropriate that's involved. And then, and then they'll connect you to, you know, the uh, young person that um, they've already identified is in need. And so they take some of that, maybe the awkward dance initially away, and, you know, and, and they usually have, they often have organized programs or activities um, like CrossFit or, or maybe it's fishing or it's something else. And, uh, that you can get involved in. Again, I, I think youth sports is a coaching youth sports is, is another simple way and every community has it where you can be a mentor to, to young people. And not all those kids are, are without fathers, but some of them are, and, you, and you'll notice that. And, and so I, 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 one who's coached my kids sports a little bit, I would say that's a great way to, to get started. In my case, uh, I was taking piano lessons uh, when I was a teenager and uh, I had my first car and I had no idea how to care for it. Um, I didn't have a father around to teach me those things. And uh, after my lessons, my piano teacher's husband would just go right into that role. And uh, we would spend the rest of the time working on cars together. Um, I would help him with his car and learn vital skills like how to change the brakes, how to do a tune up, how to change the oil, basic things that you should probably know. Yeah. Um, and then. He would ask me, well, you know, when's the last time you changed your oil on, on your car? Oh, uh, I can't remember. Well, guess what? We're doing an oil change right now. Uh, that, that was a valuable experience. Yeah. Yeah. And so then yeah. I passed those skills on, on to my own kids, hmm. but somebody, some guy saw the need and cared enough to step up in, yeah. in a very simple way. He wasn't the foster dad. Um, or any of that capacity, he just simply saw a need and he stepped in to fill it. Yeah. Look at that generational impact. He, he, he met your need as a young person. And then you've learned how to model that same thing for your own children. And so now, you know, generation removed, it's still having an impact because of what he did. And so that's, that's a great story. Yeah. Don't be afraid to step up in ways where you see there is a void and go in and fill that void because, uh, yeah, he has left a legacy, whether he realized it or not, he did. Mm -hmm. He left a legacy. So Ray, how can dads get a hold of you or get their questions answered or learn more about being a foster dad? <laughs> yeah. So well, I'll say if you're in Montana, which is where I live, <laughs> you can contact me directly. And my day job is talking with people about these things and specifically foster care and adoption. Uh, and so you can easily get a hold of me there. You could uh, reach me um, by email as well. If anyone wanted to contact me, it's my name, raybiggerstaff at gmail.com. Simple as that. And I would love to talk to anyone that likes to talk about these things or ask questions specifically around foster care and adoption and how to step into that. That's that's my, that's my wheelhouse. And Ray, as we close, what is your challenge to dads listening now? Hmm. Yeah. Well, see, I, I've heard it said a present and loving father has the power to positively impact generations. We've talked about this a little bit already. So to those dads out there and, or to those men who will one day be a dad, don't underestimate your superpower. 
that you have the power to positively impact generations. Uh, so use it to conquer the world one child at a time, I say. So take advantage of it, look for opportunities and and uh, enjoy the the pleasure. You, you, you feel like a man when you're able to step in in a father-like figure for a boy. And, and, yes, and you do. For everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so use that superpower to, to for the advantage of everyone around you. Just to make things a little bit easier, um, I know Ray dropped some uh, an email and uh, there's some links too. I'm going to make it very easy to find that information. So if you go to thefatherhoodchallenge.com, that's thefatherhoodchallenge.com, and you go to this episode, go to the episode description and look right below it. I will have the links posted there so everything will be easy to find. Well, Ray, it has been an honor to have you on the Fatherhood Challenge. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fatherhood Challenge. If you would like to contact us, listen to other episodes, find any resource mentioned in this program, or find out more information about the Fatherhood Challenge, please visit thefatherhoodchallenge.com. That's thefatherhoodchallenge.com.